The Voting Rights Act turns 56 years old this weekend. The landmark 1965 civil rights legislation dramatically expanded access to the ballot box. Up until then, hundreds of thousands of black Americans were barred from even registering to vote. In an op-ed in The Washington Post this week, Attorney General Merrick Garland said 56 years later, Congress should act again to protect voting rights. In recent months, state legislatures across the country have passed strict new voting laws. So to talk more about this, I want to bring in Antoine Seawright and Leslie Sanchez. Antoine is a CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist, and Leslie is a CBS News political analyst and Republican strategist. So, Antoine, let's start with you. Tell us about the Voting Rights Act. What did it take to get such a monumentally important piece of legislation through Congress 56 years ago? Well, thank you for having me. Look, this conversation around voting rights has always been about control, power, and influence. And those of us who are of the African seed and the American son and daughter have always been under this uh, idea of suffocation and suppression and being left out at the ballot box. Keep in mind of how we got to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, it was in 63 when the country was in complete chaos and turmoil. Black people were being, uh, had dogs put on them, being sprayed by water hoses, and so Kennedy wanted to act and he wanted to get something done. And so he pushed for, after a speech, the, he advocated for the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, that was delayed. He then met with King's top lieutenants as they were preparing for the March on Washington of August of 63. Uh, he agreed to support the March on Washington. Uh, shortly after the March on Washington happened, uh, King was, I'm sorry, the president was assassinated. Along came President Johnson. He pushed and advocated for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was later passed, and while it dismantled Jim Crow, there were still some power brokers at the local level who knew that power, influence, and control was part of the conversation. So they put in things like poll taxes, literacy tests, uh, counting how many uh, bubbles you can get from a piece of bubble gum to keep black people from participating at the ballot box. Fast forward the tape as we jog through history a bit, it was John Lewis and others who marched in to Selma in March of 1964 in order to uh, advocate for have black people having the right to vote. Uh, a week later, it was President Johnson who gave that famous speech that we all remember from history class that called for a voting rights act to be implemented so that there can be free and fair, fair access at the ballot box. Uh, and then it happened. Uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 happened all because Johnson stepped up to lead. And that's how we got to this point. But it did not stop there in terms of suffocation and suppression. Although the Voting Rights Act was renewed in 2006 by Republican President Bush, in 2013, the, the conservative-leaning Supreme Court decided to gut Section 4, which gave preclearance in Section 5. So that means any state who wanted to make changes to their voting laws had to get clearance from the Department of Justice. When that happened and the Supreme Court's decision was made all around the country, in particular the South, there were places where voting precincts were moved, early voting was dismantled, voting purges happened. And then we have now the 2020 election where the big lie happened. People said there were uh, there was uh, some sort of mishap at the voting box. The, the election was not fair. We also know from previous elections that the biggest case of election fraud have happened by Republicans uh, across this country. So now in 48 states, there are laws being implemented to suppress the votes of people who look like me, and that's why this conversation around voting rights is the most consequential of our day as it was in 1965. And Antoine, we mentioned that the Attorney General has weighed in on this, and he says that Congress needs to step up uh, to protect the right to vote. Leslie, let me turn to you. Is the Attorney General wrong? The attorney general is part of a larger conversation that sounds a lot more like partisan politics uh, than a review of history. I will say that Antoine really eloquently described the atrocities with regards to black voters' inability to reach the polls and have their vote counted in America half a century ago, more than half a century ago. But the conversation today is being mischaracterized. It's hearkening as if there has not been any advancement, not only in allowing communities of color to vote,
allowing the states to take control, as they are allowed to by the Constitution, to take control of, and control their own uh, voting rights, and also the ability to, to account for, uh, uh, you know, mishaps or grievances or areas where they need to be evaluated so that the public continue to have confidence in the electoral system. 2020 was such an anomaly with the pandemic, with the changes, and it led to a tremendous amount of confusion. Uh, I would agree with Antoine on the big lie. It led to a lot of people not, uh, you know, really solidifying their belief in, in President Biden being the legitimate president, which he is. But there's a deeper issue here, and that is that states fundamentally are adjusting and, and, and uh, making those concessions with their voters for what they feel is important. And what the Democrats and what the, what the president and what you heard the attorney general advocating for is a nationalization of those election rights, is allowing the Department of Justice to have that preclearance. And even the moderate Democrats in the Senate have said that's a bridge too far. They're trying to look for some amenable solution to bring everybody together that is not as extreme as preclearance, because who is fundamentally deciding what that preclearance is going to be? And it supplants the state's rights, which is a big part of this conversation. The other part that I think always gets ignored in this, in this is the, the examples that are pointed to for this broad reach of nationalizing elections are Georgia, are all the states that Antoine talked about. But many of those states are the red states, these Republican states, are measured equally, if not having a, 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 as much advancement as the blue northeastern states, or, so, or even the, state, the president's home state of Delaware. If you compare and contrast what states actually have in the books in terms of voting right laws, there's more opportunity to vote with some of these changes in Republican states. So I, again, I think it's very murky. I think it gets mischaracterized. And I agree with Antoine, this is about power. This is ultimately, which is why it's so partisan. Who can control getting their supporters to the vote, to to uh, the voter, to vote on on election day? And what the public is really yearning for is clarity and ensuring that the integrity of the electoral system is sound. That's the part where Republicans and Democrats need to come together, can find some common ground, and and hopefully get away from the the uh, the, the extreme rhetoric on both sides. So, Leslie, on that, you know, last year's presidential election was deemed fair and secure. You mentioned uh, the state uh, interest in this, but why are state governments like Texas and Georgia trying to fix something that is not broken? I would say that states like Texas have been doing this for over a decade, uh, way over a decade. Many of these states have. Um, the biggest areas that you're looking at, for example, no excuse absentee voting. That you, In some states, it was so much more restrictive. But Georgia, the peach state we've been talking about, a big part of this conversation, has now installed no excuse, no excuse absentee voting. They're putting that into law. States like Delaware don't even have that. Te uh, the another area that, of concern is identification. Texas has had this issue for a long time, is having a real ID, some sort of identification uh, that, to ensure that the people that are voting match the people that are on the rolls. And that's, that's truly who they are. Georgia has extended that beyond in-person voting to show your identification, but to also account for it in mail-in ballots. And even uh, some of the stalwarts on the, on the left, such as Stacey Abrams, it, are now starting to come around on the need for identification in voting. That should not be something that people are fighting about. So again, I would say that these have been areas uh, that each individual state had been working on for many years. But certainly at a time of extreme political, politicalization and polarization, uh, I, it takes a lot more time to get down into the details, uh, but the extreme response of nationalizing all these elections and, and supplanting, again, states' rights is, is a, no, a non-starter for Republicans. And Antoine, one more question uh, for you now. You gave us the history at the beginning, but the anniversary of the passage of the Voting Rights Act is a bittersweet one in the eyes of many activists because the law was severely weakened by the Supreme Court back in 2013. Uh, in 2021, there is a conservative supermajority on the bench. Are Democrats confident that if they do pass something that it won't just get struck down? Well, I pray and hope so. And truth be told, the court should be isolated from the political realities of Democrats and Republicans. But just know what some of these suppression laws look like in some of these states. 
it would be illegal to give someone food and water in line in a place like Georgia, a place where, as I talked about earlier, what the Supreme Court decision of 2013 did, it essentially gave Georgia the ability to move precincts without telling people, purging of voter rolls as a letter went out from Governor Kemp to, so, to 100 some odd thousand Georgia voters, telling them basically that their names will be purged from the voter rolls. We saw in Texas, the largest African-American county, they removed the drop box, so early voting was not a reality. There's some of these things that are just real acts of political malpractice when it comes to participating and people's right to participate. And guess what? Every single time Republicans go after election changes in states, the impact they have, and this has been said by Democrats and Republicans, fall on people who look like me. And that is the problem. And these things only happen when Republicans lose elections and when you have a high surge in voter turnout across the country. I don't want to remind people, the largest case of election fraud in modern day history happened in the North Carolina 9 election in 2018 by a Republican candidate, and we cannot ignore that. We cannot ignore the realities that people who look like me suffer as it relates to our right to participate at the ballot box. Okay, Antoine and Leslie, thank you both for that conversation. Thank, thank you. you.